evening and welcome to TV3 News Journal. I'm Carla Beard. The old Junior High South building is in the process of being demolished. We spoke with school board president Leslie Jacobs, Superintendent Scott Collins, and Director of Transportation Daryl Drew about the building, the demolition, and the area's future. You know, this building has been in disrepair for a very long time. And while we were able to, to provide the gym for use in the community for a period of time far beyond really the life of the building, so many parts of the building were not usable just because of the state of disrepair. And it got to a point where we just felt that it was not safe. And to repair the building would have cost so much money, it would not have really been worth it for the age of the building. And we did walk some nonprofits through it, and they took a look at things, and you know, and it was just going to be too much for them to put into it because after getting there with the contractor and looking on the building and being on the roof, the walls are pulling away from the floor. So the actual building is bowed like this, so it's coming apart at the top, which is letting a lot of water leak in. So the floor underneath the gym floor was there was two inches of water underneath there. Well, as our school board is the governing body that makes those decisions, we will be discussing this in upcoming meetings. Uh, I received my direction from them uh, after providing the information that they request. And um, at this point, it's going to be green space. Uh, that was part of the uh, contract was that they would return the whole block into green space minus the sidewalks that surround the perimeter. So right now it's going to be green space that we will maintain and then it really will be a discussion on what we do with the property after that and that will be a school board decision. The farmers market opens May 14th and right now they're accepting applications for vendors. Sabrina Gavin talked with Stephanie Ruff and Becky Marvel from the Purdue Extension Office about how to become a vendor. The farmer's market runs from May until uh, 14th until the end of September. Um, we end the season with a uh, event for the animal shelter actually. And um, so it's a very big event. You're welcome to come weekly. Uh, it will be a $7 fee or you can pay $50 for the whole market season. And that includes Thursdays and Saturdays, the first Thursday of every month and Saturdays um, through the end of September. Anyone who is local um, in the surrounding counties to Fayette County um, is welcome to come to the Fayette County Farmers Market. You do have to put in an application. Um, you can do that by contacting the Purdue Extension Office um, or emailing us at FAYCO, F-A-Y-C-O, Farmers Market at gmail.com um, and you have to fill out an application in a week before any market so make sure to contact us before then. The market meets at the uh, courthouse parking lot on Central and 5th and so look at look for the white tents we encourage everyone to bring a tent because in the summertime it can get pretty hot and also Remember that if you have any questions at all, we're here to help you. We want your business to be successful because when it's successful, it makes our communities successful. We have um, many vendors. Um, we're always looking to support our local agriculture community, um, local gardeners. You do not have to come every week to be able to sell your produce at the market and you are welcome to come uh, even at a weekly basis, but we'd love to have you. Now that spring is here, many of us are collecting limbs and yard waste and preparing flower beds that need mulch. The city of Connersville transfer station on South Highway 1 converts downed limbs into free mulch. Here's more. I'm happy to announce that the compost site is back open for the summer season. We are open right now, Monday through Saturday from 8 to 3 o'clock. On Saturdays, we close an hour for lunch between 11 and 12. The compost site is happy to pick up limbs or is happy to receive limbs and leaves and uh, anything related to yard waste. We will also begin to, begin to pick up yard waste on April the 6th. On Wednesday, you can call the street department 
phone number at 825-1421 and listen for the prompt that will tell you to leave a message about your yard waste address. When we pick up yard waste, we, you have to bundle your limbs and they have to be no more than four feet long in bundles and not weigh more than 25 pounds or so. So for now, for the next couple of months while uh, people are cleaning out their gardens and cleaning up their yards, we'll be open every day of the week. Eventually we'll settle back in on our regular hours, which is Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And remember, on Saturdays, we close for lunch for one hour between 11 and noon. Many of us remember the excitement of taking a 4-H project to the Fayette County Free Fair. The Purdue Extension Office held a Spring into 4-H event at Expo Hall on March 12th. We spoke with Extension Agent Heather Caldwell and others about participating in 4-H. 4-H, as everybody knows, part of 4-H is showing at the fair, an exhibit in the exhibit hall, animals in the show arena. 4-H offers so much more than that. There's scholarship opportunities. There's 4-H camp for kids grade three through eight. Kids grades nine through 12 can be 4-H camp counselors. There's also several academies and workshops that are more career focused. Those are held at Purdue University, and we have those types of opportunities as well. You get to meet new people and try new things. I love it so much because I get to teach the kids how to train their dogs, how to um, perform in business meetings, and the responsibilities. My favorite part is getting to meet all the new people and helping them learn all the things that 4-H has. One of the things I truly emphasize is communicating, having the kids do demonstrations, getting up in front of the other 4-H'ers. I think 4-H is very important for kids as they're growing up because um, it exposes them to a lot of different um, hobbies and things that they might be interested in that might eventually turn into a career later on. Um, so I think having that exposure when they're younger really helps um, helps them find what they're good at. Fayette County Extension Office, we are located in the basement of the courthouse. Our phone number is 825-8502. Facebook is probably one of the best places to get information on us. We try and post information almost every day to keep people up to date on deadlines, events that are happening, such as our event today. Um, that is Purdue Extension dash Fayette County. Discover Connorsville will be holding a casino night fundraiser on April 1st at the venue on 5th Street. Here's Brad Wilson to tell us more about the event and its purpose. We are having a fundraising event this year. Obviously the past couple with COVID was um, limited uh, what we could do, but we're having hosting a casino night. Um, Actually, in what was known as Mickey's is now the venue on 5th, and it's uh, an event center and wedding chapel. So we're going to be holding it there, and pleased to say they're in the Main Street area. Funds from the casino night uh, will go predominantly towards the Oasis. Um, that's... Um, uh, where th the majority of our resources go uh, because we have water there, we have electricity there and, and just overall upkeep and improvement and this year uh, our goal is to put up a stage area with the pergola and host um, some additional events. Gleaner's Food Bank delivers staples and fresh produce four times a year to people of Fayette County. We spoke with Becky Marvel and Patty Robinson who chair this event and with volunteers. Hey, we're at the former Kmart parking lot right now and we are getting ready to do a Gleaner senior distribution and we will be serving or having food for 600 and 650 households. <laughs> I used to be the driver for Nellis Adult Daycare and during some of my pickup of old people, bring them to the daycare or whatever, I ran into people who were literally starving to death. And so I started going to the pantries and picking up food and taking it and delivering it to them, especially when I knew their kids couldn't. 
And so still pick up for, well, six households all together when I can. And then I take it to two ladies who don't have driver's license and their cars, well, one lady has a car, but she can't drive it. So um, I pick it up and take it to people we know. And then whatever we have extra, we give it to neighbors and other people that needs it, you know. I'm here to pick up food for me and my husband and a friend of mine who has had five heart Okay. Open heart surgeries, and her husband has leukemia. We come up here when Gleaners is in town. Just it gives me and her time to bond away from everyone else, and we talk, and we give our friends. We're getting them a box today as well because they don't have the transportation to get up here. If you'd like to support Gleaners, go online to Gleaners.org. March 12th was a day to celebrate women at a special luncheon in the Miller Building at Roberts Park. We spoke with Linda Fitzgerald about this event. Because this is Women's History Month, and Tuesday, the 8th of March, is International Women's Day. And to my knowledge, it's never really been celebrated, um, even in the United States, but particularly in Fayette County. So this is the inaugural event of Celebrate Women, Women of Excellence, Fayette County. So we've been working on this together for three months and uh, hope everybody enjoyed the event and the displays and enjoyed our time together to celebrate women in our community. Well, I, I have some ideas for next year, which I will share with the group. And, and I would like to see this become an annual event. I think it's important for women to be recognized for, for what we do for the community. If you have a news item or upcoming event, contact TV3 online at Local TV3 on Facebook or by email at info at localtv3.com. Now, here's Brad Coulter looking back. Hi, I'm Brad Coulter and this is Looking Back. This story is a snapshot in time, 1952 Connersville. October 1952 in Connersville was a tumultuous time. The average hustle and bustle locally, seven years after the end of the Second World War was busy and noisy to say the least. Connersville had become a city where things were built and our little city was growing faster than ever. But things during this October were more out of sorts than usual. The news each day from Korea headlined the news examiner with the story about the position of the troops and whether our boys' efforts had gained or lost ground. The battles of White Horse Mountain, Sniper Ridge, and Triangle Hill were the news of the day. A national coal strike threatened to shut down half the country, and by the middle of the month had President Truman and labor leaders at each other's throats. The rising cost of living had been a nagging problem since 1946 but had grown 17% in the last two years, and local workers' wages were hardly keeping up. The labor struggles had worked their way to the local level as the UAW was near a work stoppage at Roots Blower. The new medium of television was beginning to reach the masses, and nearly every business in Connersville was trying to get in on the action. The number of homes that had TV nationwide in 1950 was 9%, but by 1960 would reach 90%. So in 1952, everyone that didn't have a TV was trying to figure out how to get one. The average cost was $299. Keep in mind, in today's dollars, it would be equivalent to $2,800. Connersville had several businesses offering television. Guarantee Auto had a 17-inch model for $229 with $23 down and $3.50 per week. Hanson Appliances at 115 West 7th Street had a 17 inch for $189.95 cash only. Hastings on East 5th Street had a 21 inch for $3.99 and they would give you $80 for your old radio and trade. Hebe TV sales at 216 West 19th Street also had a payment plan. Locally, the news wasn't much better. Mayor Glenn Henderson was under indictment for embezzlement and a slew of other charges related to his clerk treasurer and some missing funds. 
The whole month was filled with news of jury selection and lawyer maneuvering, and it led to quite an unrest in the community, as Mayor Henderson was quite a beloved figure. Eventually, a special judge determined the whole thing was baseless, and the charges against the mayor were abated. A local juvenile vandalism problem became so serious during the month that a 10 p.m. curfew was instituted until the situation calmed down. Quite a number of neon signs were destroyed and tankers of fuel oil were emptied onto the ground. The culprits were finally apprehended and their parents held responsible. A neon sign at Gutman's Trading Post had been shot, but it was determined the sign wasn't working before the vandalism. On the other hand, some good things were going on also. Bev Dixon was planning a Santa Claus review to raise funds for the E.W. Tapman Christmas Fund. At least 100 dancers were expected to participate in the elaborate production. The Fayette Community Fund had kicked off its annual drive and the goal was nearly $40,000. The total would eventually be met with big contributions from Rex, Stant, McQuay Norris, American Kitchens, and other manufacturing employers. All this uproar was leading to a rousing election season. Both candidates for governor were in Connorsville for major outdoor rallies. Local Republican Chairman Paul Tingle introduced eventual Governor, governor Craig, and local Democrat Party Chair Eddie Volz introduced Governor Schricker to town. Political rallies in those days were held in the park, and many thousands of people would attend to hear the speakers, as there was no other way to get a look at them. Finally, it was election day and 12,268 voters showed up to vote out of 16,000 registered. This amounted to an astounding 76%. Dwight Eisenhower was elected president and all the Republicans swept into office with him from the top of the ticket to the bottom. Things soon settled down and Connorsville got back to work. Within the next year, a new Rex plant on the north end of town that would employ thousands of people was announced. Also, a new wastewater plant and the Spartan Bowl were soon to come. By the end of the decade, Dan M would be making dishwashers and anyone in town that wanted to work had a good paying job. Turns out, an uproarious 1952 led to probably the best generation of profound success and prominence Connorsville had ever seen. <laughs>